Ladies and gentlemen, come on in, have a seat. Uh, I'm Sam Blood, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my compatriot, uh, Ron Kendall, who uh, comes from the Eastern Townships near Montreal, a beautiful town called Gromont. I was just saying how much I'd like to live there rather than in a big city, big smoke. Uh, my introduction will be brief, um, but I, I wanted to say that I have a friend who teaches a course at one of the leading business schools in Canada, which is called Getting It Done. The entire course is just Getting It Done. And I, amidst all the theory and everything else that's taught there, he is the only one that actually teaches a course about affecting uh, change. When I think of Ron, I think of effective change. Uh, there's two things that he said. The first thing, and the most challenging thing about technology today is the leadership that's required uh, to affect the change to get it in place. Uh, and I think that's true from my own experience. I can speak to that. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, when a child fails uh, in education, we all fail. So, using technology and it's in the way that it, it helps retention rates uh, is clearly a major priority going forward. Uh, Ron spent most of his career with Eastern Townships uh, School Board Executive Director. Uh, he was the first to implement effectively one laptop, one child program there, and it is still the only one in Canada. I, he's now the executive director of the Canadian Education Association. Uh, he speaks broadly um, about uh, technology and education. And um, I'm thrilled to introduce him here today. Thank you, Sam. Um, good afternoon, and I will do a formal part of my presentation right now. And then after that, I will be very clear and say A quite often and uh, go a little more informal, and I will take my jacket off. Uh, the first thing I would like to then say is uh, greetings from the Canadian Education Association, to the Minister of Education, to the delegates and colleagues from Japan, to our colleagues and educators from across Canada and around the world. Uh, we bring you greetings from the Canadian Education Association. De la part de mes collègues francophones au Canada, je vous souhaite la bienvenue. Si jamais vous venez au Québec et au Canada, s'il vous plaît, n'hésitez pas de venir chez nous. As I've said in French, in the official language of Canada, uh, if ever you do come to Canada and to Quebec, please don't hesitate. Come and visit us. Our doors are always welcome. They come in the summertime. <laughs> Winter time. That's and you're seeing a Canadian, by the way. Uh, and I got myself in trouble once at a cocktail party in Washington, D.C. when I jokingly said to four women standing there, well, I'm always favor global warming. I'm from Canada. <laughs> Only to discover that Al Gore's wife was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm used to putting my foot in my mouth sometimes because, as uh, people have said to me in the past, uh, you tend to be very, very outspoken, Ron, and you tend to be very irreverent as well. Um, and I tell them, well, for me, it's got to do about children. I'll be anything, and I'll do it. And I'll try to do it as well. Uh, not for me. So I'm going to start this off, my presentation, even before I start my presentation, which, by the way, I found this picture. Uh, the, wow. You know, like I saw this, and yeah, you know, this is the type of thing we need to see more of. Children smiling, okay? Uh, and I'll tell you an experience about some clowns from the Civil today. That's another story. But I'm glad, I've got six questions I want to ask you. You're not going to put your hands up, but you're just simply going to answer them. And it's kind of like the precursor of my presentation. How many of you believe that cemeteries are filled with people who felt they were indispensable? <laughs> How many of you believe that the life you're living is actually a dress rehearsal? You've got another shot. How many of you use Twitter? Yes, I know. Uh, how many of you have played a video game that lasted more than three hours? How many of you have spoken while driving 
talking on the cell phone while you're driving. And finally, how many of you people believe that those who sit at the front of a conference and the speakers are the early adapters and the mid adapters and late adapters? <laughs> this is mostly a conference of early adapters, no doubt about it, because when I have given presentations elsewhere, sometimes there are people like, if they were on the other side of the window, they would be. And they're like this attending the conference. That's how far they don't want to be this close in case someone like myself dares to ask them a question, which they don't want to answer. So, I want, I want to bring you on this trip of mine, and it's a voyage, and it's been a voyage. Um, it's a picture of Sedona, and in effect, impressive, but not convincing. And that was a title that I came to uh, develop about 18 months ago, just prior to my presenting with Sir Ken Robinson, who shared the stage together. And when I was with Sir Ken, and I told him this was the name of my presentation, you should have seen his eye, and came right up to here. Really? And he said, uh, why? I said, well, Sir Ken, I cannot tell you how many conferences I've attended on improving education. I cannot tell you how often I've heard people say, that is so impressive. And I also cannot tell you how many people I've heard say to me, but I can't do that back in my district. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, it put me onto a different mission, a different life force. So, try this. What you are in the process of actually doing is demonstrating to yourself how your brain is so malleable, regardless of your age. And by the way, when I was listening to Tony this morning and Jim, and I heard Laura and, and uh, uh, Jeff, uh, it just you, you stole a lot of my thunder. You know, you really took a lot of my message of what I was trying to say. <laughs> Darn. But you know what? You know, so inspiring, but also very convincing for me. Very convincing for me. And the one thing, though, that you know, when we talk of technology and how our we're going to be living longer. That's great news, but there is some not so good news. If you speak to the brain research, the brain scientists, they still haven't uncovered the mapping in terms of how to slow down the deterioration of the brain. So even though we may live to 120 years old, there may be another issue there. And we've got to look at that one as well. So let's just think about this for a second and see more facts. If we could project any sort of democratic world, we have to assume that education and learning to think differently, and that is learning to learn how to think, is going to be a, an essential contribution, maybe the essential contribution to that. I feel very deeply committed to the idea that uh, although rationality isn't everything, and passion and interests and faith of various sorts count as much, nevertheless, uh, rationality is a force for the good. And the more people are capable of rational, critical thinking, the better the world will be. The more they have access to knowledge about the rest of the world, the better the world will be. Take it from the clip from One Laboratory for Child. And I've had, I had the opportunity of meeting Seymour Crawford on a number of occasions. Always a little cringe because you never knew with Seymour exactly what he would say to you when you told him you thought you were doing something fantastic. Uh, but um, quite inspirational, and for those who haven't read Mind Storms that he wrote in the early 80s, I strongly suggest that you do. Seymour Papert with Alan Kay in 1970 on a, lap, on a napkin designed a laptop being used by children in 1970. And Seymour Papert in 2004, 2005 in Australia was invited to be the keynote speaker for technology and education. And he began his speech by saying that the worst thing you should do is have a conference on technology and education. <laughs> and the reason he said was because have they ever had books on, on education? You know, have you ever had conferences where all of a sudden we're talking about desks? And the fact that we singularly isolate technology as something that is different, we are in effect putting it behind the eight ball. And in our district, we learned some very, very hard lessons. And I'll, sh I'll share that with you. So let's take a look at some other people, but what I wanted to share with you is that one of the things that we now know about our lives is that we are complex creatures, and we are complex individuals, and we are actually able to do complex things, many times at the same time. It's called threading. So my presentation, I'm going to thread with you, and I'm going to share with you my life. 
a part of my life and the meaningful moments of it and what it did to me and how it changed me. But more importantly, what I believe ended up how it changed many children of which I've had the beautiful, beautiful opportunities to do this. So I will share with you the past, the present, the future, and I will also talk to you about the mind, the soul, and the heart. Because in my estimation, you cannot do anything in education unless you bring these three elements together at all times. So, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They already know what you truly want to become, Steve Jobs. And you will see a theme, by the way, hopefully it won't take you very long to start to see what I would really actively be promoting. Marshall McLuhan from Canada. Our age of anxiety is in great part the result of trying to do today's jobs with yesterday's tools and yesterday's concepts. We drive into the future using only our rear view mirror. And uh, he, he said that in 1963. So can you imagine what Marshall McLuhan would be saying nowadays? Okay, uh, maybe a little on the scary side. Of course, Albert Einstein, a person who never made a mistake, never tried anything new. Any intelligent fool can make things bigger and more complex. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. The true sign of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination. Albert Einstein. But what did he know? <laughs> Maya Angelou. Courage is the most important of all of the virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. You can practice any virtue erratically, but nothing consistently without courage. And when I've heard what Bhutan is doing, is courageous. It is courageous. And what you're doing, Jim, in this institute here is courageous. And what many of you are trying to do is courageous. And to be ready, be prepared for the pushback. Because it will be intense. Why? Because as Clay Shirky said, institutions will always try to preserve the problem to which they are the solution. <laughs> And that inherently describes the challenges that we face. So, let me just bring to you a bit to you about my past. And there I am, being a, a theater, in theater, being an actor, doing certain plays. Wandering Scholar from Paradise, Comédie de l'Arte play, Hugues Roi, a farce from, set in France, written by Alfred Jarry, The Birthday Party by Harold Pinter, Macbeth by... Some, some guy, Shakespeare. Um, and this one, Six Characters in Search of an Author. Luigi Pirandello, Nobel Prize laureate, wrote this. I again suggest that you read this play, because what it does, I believe, is also very much describes the world of education as we know it. We are trying to find a meaning. We are trying to find an author. And we are in search of this. So we are in search as much, not only for what is better for children, but actually for our own meaning for ourselves. And then how do we reconcile this? And then something else happened to me on October 24, 2001 at 1257. At that point, I was wheeled into the operating room and had quadruple heart bypass. Why? Because I thought I was indispensable. I thought that I had to do everything for everybody at all times. And I forgot about myself. And so I realized coming out of this operation, and by the way, if you're feeling lethargic or anything, I strongly suggest bypass surgery. Pick you up. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> energy levels are going to come out. You will be flowing with energy. You, you, trust me, because when I returned from this operation, I literally drove my team nuts. Okay? Two months later, I promised myself after this surgery that I would climb to the top of Mont Bomo, which I did. And, and, I, and I walked to the, I didn't climb, I just had to walk, so it's not like you really do have to climb. <laughs> I just walked, okay, like this, but it was still an uphill steep walk, nonetheless. But I did realize that all of a sudden, time was finite. So the expression to me in education that slow down, Ron, change is slow in education, I don't accept anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't buy that, I don't, I don't agree with it. And John Cotter out of the Harvard Business School said it best. It's called death by delay. <laughs> Take a great idea, no problem. First thing you do is, if it comes from a superintendent, you check out the contract. How long is the contract to the superintendent? <laughs> However long it is, is how much you're going to delay it. <laughs> Whatever he wants to do or she wants to do. If it's a minister, how long is that minister going to be in place? And it's the same thing. So trust me, okay, there are various strategies out there that people will use on non-stop occasions, okay, to simply delay things. One of my favorite things is called the pilot project. 
<laughs> That's another talk. And then, at that same very same time, though, I was in the Eastern Township School Board, and in Quebec, a superintendent of a school district is called the Director General, the Directeur General. It's a, still a Napoleonic term. Um, I, I know my colleagues in the United States, they kind of like that title. They say, hey, Director General, that sounds pretty good. Better than superintendent. You know it is. But uh, I was very fortunate because I arrived in a context of true serendipity and being with people who had been, become very, very frustrated with change or the lack of it. And so what we decided to do was to provide a laptop to every child from grade 3 to grade 11, the last year of high school in Quebec, teachers, everybody, in 2003. We did this, by the way, in terms of preparation and planning for a year and a half before. So we, we really did make sure, hold on a second, I'm just going to do this. We, we really made sure that we had done the planning. So we ended up itemizing 207 elements, 207 questions that we felt needed to be answered before we began the deployment. And then at the press conference, someone asked me question number 208. <laughs> it came. We were there. Apple was the supplier. And we had a big press conference. There was about 100 media, 150 media there. A parent had come in to the group. And the parent, right in the middle of the press conference, put his hand up and said, I got a question for this guy, Canuel. So I said, OK, here it comes. And he said, I can't believe what you're doing. I cannot believe that you're taking $15 million, of which you don't have and the board doesn't have, you're going to go and spend it on this while our schools are falling apart. The walls need painting, the, the, the desks are falling apart, the roof's leaking, and you're buying laptops? Are you out of your mind? So needless to say, the cameras shift right towards me, and I'm saying internally, oh my god, we didn't think of that question like this. But you know what? And that, that's when I remembered my bypass. I remembered what I had been looking and doing and trying to do for years. And I just looked at the parent and I said, you know what, here's what I do know. You will hold me accountable for the quality of education that your daughter's going to receive when she leaves our schools. So I had to make a choice. The wall or your daughter, I chose your daughter guilty. <laughs> and I took a stance and everyone with me had the same stance. The trustees, the elected officials, all said, that's our stance. We're taking a stand on this. And sure enough, we did it. So we did this. And then first research results, initial learning results. And when we announced this to my colleagues in 2003, my other superintendent colleagues in the province, they said to me, Ooh, not so fast, wrong, we're not going to do this. No way. Not until we see the results, the research, the support, the financing. And I said to myself, well, that's a fair enough question. It's a fair enough request. And I said, okay, now give me five years, please. I need five years, not five weeks or five months, as the media kept doing and asking, so any change, anything happening? I said, give me five years. And so over five years, things changed. We had even smart technologies in 2006 give us interactive whiteboards. We then had the Cirque du Soleil. I don't know, I don't know if you're familiar with the Cirque du Soleil. Many of you are. They contacted us. Uh, since 2007, by the way, the Eastern Township School Board is providing blended learning to the minor artists of the Silk Soleil shows around the world. Teachers are teaching from their homes, their bedrooms, synchronously, anywhere between 9 to 11 o'clock at night when they're teaching the kids in Tokyo. We've been doing it now. The school board's been doing it for four years. The Silk Soleil people have said to us, how come the rest of education don't, like, don't, I went, don't go there, don't go there. <laughs> Curious. I mean, one of the most innovative com companies in the world, still to today, cannot understand why the world of education is not moving in this way. And then finally, the internal support. So in 2008, we came up with the results. So we did this. So the results went up in 2008. What results? Our dropout rate was at 42%. We halved it. By the way, not our numbers from the government. We halved it to 22%. Our, we were ranked in terms of high school leaving results, in terms of success rates, out of 69 school boards, we were 67. Okay? As a matter of fact, the year before that, I had said something <laughs> that I, I'll never forget. I said uh, to my trustees at a meeting when we were 66, I said, well, we can't get any worse. <laughs> we did. We managed to become 67 the following year. Oh, my God. But five years later, we were 23rd. Those are results. 
external results. We had research as well being done by, two, by a university who were conducting the research. Now this is always a very contentious area because when you're trying to measure creativity, critical thinking, these elements, these are exceptionally soft, what we call soft indicators, hard to measure. But at that time, they were difficult to measure. So the results from the research basically indicated that it was having a significant impact on result on reading and on writing. As a matter of fact, our teachers were regularly complaining that students were writing too much, using the laptops, writing too much. Okay. Uh, then when we did the survey, we surveyed our parents, our teachers, our students, the administrators, the support. So we wanted to know. So in 2008, we had, we had great support. People were saying, keep this up, keep doing it. In terms of the financing, well, we were having difficulties. We had challenges. We, got, we secured some bank loans, we had a foundation, but we had a debt. And people kept saying, oh, you see, you have that debt, you should never have done it. And we said, that's funny, you call it a debt, we called it an investment. And we said, that's the difference in terms of paradigm. So here we were, folks, we provided the evidence that people were looking for. And here was the result. We were left alone. <laughs> people just simply got away from us. They moved away from us. And so ironically, that around 2010, 2011, as a matter of fact, just when I retired from the school board in 2010, one month after I left, the premier of the province announces that he's giving laptops to all the teachers. Of course, when I heard that, I said, was he waiting for me to leave? And I used to do it. But we're all alone. So I bring this forward to you to consider as well that when colleagues say to you, show us all of this, show us the evidence, I can assure you, that's not really what it is. It's called death by delay. They're just trying to put it off, okay? Because they know there's something else at play. So I said to myself, but just what, what's missing? You know? So is it the, re the research, the result? Is it support? No. Is it more money? And then I remembered something that someone had said to me once. Innovators get attacked. Followers prosper. That's exactly the situation I went, oh yeah. So now, here's where I set out another cautionary note to you. I gave a presentation not too long ago with some superintendents and it made them bristle. But I said, I'm now starting to see both across the United States and Canada, in particular, and in Australia, and in the UK, uh, I'm now starting to see large deployments of technology. But I have a question. Is it by, because of innovation or capitulation? Have people in the world of education just simply said, you know what, we tried our best to stop technology being integrated into our schools, so we just don't have a choice anymore, so we'll bring it all in. And that creates another, what I, what I would consider a very cautionary situation. We've got to make sure that we train and prepare the teachers in advance before you give them the technology and just plunk it into their classrooms. And so the present, here I am now as the Chief Executive Officer for the Canadian Education Association a not-for-profit organization founded in 1891. One of the feathers in our cap, I would have to say, is that in 1915, John Dewey became an honorary member. Still is. <laughs> uh, but our mandate is, is this, and, and we receive our funding from the ministries of education across Canada. We have memberships with respect to school districts, faculties of education, teacher unions, corporations, private sector uh, think tanks, uh, media, Basically, and what we are is, it's very simple, we are an action thought center with a very simple mandate, which is what attracted me to this position, because I felt at this point we needed to do something, and to do something different. And some of the research that we conduct ourselves, and there are some very important ones that I will highlight to you this afternoon, we're engaging teaching in a research that we call Teaching the Way You Aspire to Teach which we just published in July, and if you go on our website, you will be able to extract it. By the way, everything on our site is free, and in French too, in case you would like to practice your French. Everything is free. What did you do in school today is a research study that is an ongoing research study involving over 67,000 Canadian students. I can tell you Sir Ken Robinson has asked that I keep him abreast of all the developments happening there, because he believes this research is one of the validating research for what he has been saying for the last decade, if not more. And this study here is talking about the context of the intellectual engagement of children in our schools. At what level is it at? So, here's an infographic. And by the way, this is something else we discovered. When we publish research, we know that each and every one of you, when you get a research, you sit there and you'll go through every 78 pages of it. 
you know, nonstop, you know, and just read from A to Z and go through. But we also know there's a whole pile of other people who like it in an infographic. And I can tell you, when we publish the research in a document format, yes, we have people who want to see it. But this infographic that we produced shows everything in terms of one research. So 67,000 students, what about their engagement levels? Now, by intellectual engagement, we are talking of students who feel that they are being challenged to think creatively, constructively, being challenged in a way that is not just simply the regurgitation of facts. So it is very different. And we do this with, through an online survey called Tell Them From Me. And then we extract the data, and we've been doing this now for four years. So what we've noticed is that there are different levels of engagement that we know within the school. So we have what we call attendance, which is the institutional engagement. So 65% of students and Canadian students are regularly showing up to school, 65%. Kind of Canada, if you want to use standardized testing results, PISA, if you eliminate the cities, uh, which I told the OECD folks, I don't know why we have, so we're competing against cities in that sense. But if you take the cities out, Canada is in the top five countries. Now, in this, we have 65%. The sense of belonging, it seems, that once students are within their schools, they seem they feel pretty good about being in school. So the anti-bullying programs, whatever programs are in place, seem to be working all right. And participation, two out of every three students, are participating in some sort of activities within the school. But that's all around the classroom. What's more important is looking at it from the point of view of the engagement of these students in the classroom. Now, this is based on the work from Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Now, I'm going to say that name again, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, because it took me three months to be able to pronounce it. So I'm very proud of saying this. It may mean nothing to you. But when, I, when you do go on TED Talks, and if you just type in his name, which starts C-Z-Y, uh, you will clearly understand why. However, his research is what I consider actually brilliant research on the notion of engagement and the question of flow. I've noticed on Edutopia, they've been talking a lot about this now lately, about the issue of flow. And in, in California, I've been seeing some people now, it's, 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 gaining, it's starting to percolate up. But what flow is, and I'll give you an example of this, what flow is, is, is the uh, kind of like the description of where you are engaged in what you are doing, to the point of where some, the engagement is not just physical, it's mental, it's spiritual, you're engaged in it. A, a case in point, you're reading a great book, you love the book you're reading, and then someone says to you, you've been reading for three hours. That's flow. That's where you go, oh my God, it's been, I, 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 you know, I've lost track of time. Now, Csikszentmihalyi states that there are two states of flow that he has been able to observe where there's full flow, full, real 100% flow, Okay, in the education system. I'll ask the question, but I, I'll ask it quickly. Okay, can anyone under, guess where those two areas were? Okay. P.E. Well, sports. No, no, in terms of school. P.E. Oh, well, physical. Kindergarten's one. And the other? No. No, it's not No. Ph.D. Kindergarten. Ph.D. Guess what happens in between? No. And if you look here, grade five students, 82% of intellectual, intellectual engagement, 76%, 67, 57, 48, 42, 41 in grade 11, and 45 in grade 12. Kind of goes back up a bit. That's because of the dropouts. They dropped out, so it kind of bumps up here. Now, we, you know, when we do this in some of the schools, where they've had success rates of 98% with, with their average school marks are over 75%. And when they did this, in one of the schools, I can't identify, but in one of the schools, the level of intellectual engagement was 31%. In other words, when the principal and the teacher saw this, they were shocked. They said, but we thought our kids were doing well. We said, no, no, they're doing very well on the testing. They're acing it. And then when we focus group and then we talk to the students, what do they report back? Very simply. I know what the teacher wants. I give him the answer. But are you being forced to think differently? No. Am I being forced to think creatively? No. I just know what I need to do. The bright ones have figured it out. And if you don't believe me, take a look at this one here. Now, this is in a new report that we're going to be coming out in September. But this is very disconcerting because these are the elements of intellectual engagement. Effort, interest, motivation, and quality instruction. So in the students who are engaged, we can see that they are putting in quite a bit of effort. So don't worry about that. They will, they will work hard. Okay? 
But, and in quality instruction, those who are identifying that their teachers are giving them good instruction, they're reporting, yeah, like it's pretty good. It could be better, that's for sure, but it's still pretty good. But this is very disconcerting. This is what we're concerned about when we look at this and we say 33% interest and motivation, and these are the students that are succeeding? Very disconcerting. We've got to look at this. So overall, this is the latest result now that is 54% in Canada in terms of the level of intellectual engagement. And our association has begun to do professional development and offer professional development to the teachers and the principals to identify this. Here's a great, I, I love this, I love this painting. This is a painting, this is a matter of fact, probably one of the first known depictions, okay? It's the University of Bologna in the 13th century of a university classroom. <laughs> a, 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 a university classroom. Now you look at this and you go, wow, imagine an artist, this is an artist's depiction of it. But then when you take a closer look at this painting, you start to discover, oh my god, things haven't changed. Less than six of them are actually engaged. Okay, when you count them all up, the others are dueling away, they're doing whatever they're doing. And then this guy's just talking away, okay, like this. So I always find it interesting, you know, in the university, so you know, and I've heard this discussion, you know, really important. You haven't changed in 700 years, okay, and you're getting the same results. So when people would say, and I heard university professors saying, you know, laptops are a distraction. Uh, you know, that we should get rid of the laptops, you know, because it's a distraction. I would say, no, change your lesson plan. Okay, that's what you need to do. It's because you're not changing your lesson plan. A boring lesson plan, regardless of a laptop, is a boring lesson plan. Okay, and, and I would say, oh, so if we remove the laptops from the classroom, let's bring in the old clock, because that was the survivor element. Hey, how many times do we watch the clock while the guys are <laughs> okay, like that? So, we do know that. Oh, by the way, this guy over here just realized he's in the wrong class. <laughs> Look, beer. Okay, like so, 13th century. 13th century. Okay, uh, so you have to say to yourself, Yikes, you know, what is this exactly? So what we're doing is we're looking at transforming education. So we're saying, please, no more tweaking. Ben Levin, I've had discussions with Ben Levin on this and in terms of like his recommendations, Michael Fulham. We've had other people, Linda Darling Hammond, by the way, working with us, Posse Salberg. A number of people have worked with us, Sir Ken as well. And you know, it's, it's all about trying to improve the systems and trying to improve what we try to do. And cognition, as we even heard this, this morning with Tony and Jim was saying, is more network than ever. It's no longer an individualistic domain. I didn't write this up, by the way, between the presentations. Like, I didn't do this. This was, you know, what I've been putting and saying. So we need to look at it. So when we're looking at transforming, we really have to understand just what is exactly we're trying to transform. I always love this picture because I, I, I still don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know. It's just something on a van, okay, like this. But it's. Yeah, it could be our, our notion of schooling, okay, like that, but there it is. So here's something about, and this is a great picture, and it's very rare, by the way, okay? This is showing you the, uh, this is the innovation virus right here, okay? If you notice the inertia antibodies are around it, trying to kill it, okay? Like this. So this is what happens in education, okay? Innovation, mm, the antibodies move in, okay? So you, you get this often, all right? And this shows you... The challenge that, that's there, the challenge that's in front of you. So, when we look at it, the new definition of expert, okay? The new definition, where will these students post their discoveries and share their new insights? Very, very likely on YouTube, and it's banned in most school districts. Access to knowledge and info has created, a new has created new definitions of expert. These kids are coming up with so many things. I tell the adults, get out of the way. <laughs> okay, get out of the way and help just steer them. Stop trying to stop them and saying it's not important or it's not good. It's so passe. You know, I'm speaking to the group. Youth, they're making the rules they proceed. I love this one because, you know, I see school districts nonstop trying to come up with rules about how they're supposed to use it. Okay, go back to when you were a teenager and when someone said, this is the rule. What did that mean to you? Right? Rule? Okay, like this. So don't cross that barrier. <laughs> what did you do? That was it. It was the challenge. It was more important to see what would happen once you did cross the rule to see and explore that element. It was that sense of curiosity, that exploration. And when it comes to technology, I mean, and I'll tell you a filter story in a minute. And, and so empowerment versus power. This was, without a doubt, in our district, in my former district, the most difficult challenge for the teachers to move from the notion of power to the notion of empowerment. It was very challenging for them. They did it, but it took time. 
It doesn't happen in a year or two. It does take time, but as long as you become relentless in the pursuit of it, you move forward. And you have to cede some of that power. And even if you're a principal or a district leader or a minister, you have to cede some of that power to that momentum, to what's happening in front of you. And finally, the connectivity for adults it really equates into stress. You know, like this, very often for us, technology has turned into a type of very stressful notion of reading your emails, something like this. I'll never forget, even in my district, I had a school principal at one meeting, put his hand up in the middle of the meeting and said, Ron, I have a problem. What's that? Well, I, I sent email, two emails to the director of buildings and grounds, and I flagged that they were very important, and he never got back to me. I said, well, why didn't you call him? What? <laughs> why didn't you call him? Oh. It's so funny, eh? You know, like we will go to the easiest path sometimes, and sometimes forget about the human context, to be able just to talk to people and speak to people. And we should do that. We don't genuflect to technology. We use it. We don't let it take over our lives. We don't make it become us, make us become rude. I had that pointed out to me a while ago, a few years ago, and I learned my lesson. Someone came into my office. I'm doing my emails. Yeah, how, how are you? What do you can do? Like this. And he's talking to me. Mm -hmm, yeah, okay. And he says, it's rude, Ron. And he was absolutely right. You know, when someone comes in to talk to you, they deserve your undivided attention. Give it to them. But when we see all of this, and then when people say, I'm multitasking, yeah, yeah, okay. We can, but on the other hand, we have to make sure that we're not going to become rude. Connectivity for children is opportunity. I mean, in South America, as exactly as Tony was saying, more kids with cell phones, I couldn't believe that everyone had cell phones there. And the work we were doing was unbelievable. So, here I'm going to give you now six critical lessons in 90 seconds. Okay, because people always say to me, okay, Ron, don't get into this sauce, that's too much. We've got to get back to it. Get some, give us some tips. Okay, some tips. And by the way, there are no tips for changing education. There are no tips. It's called something that's right in the back here, and it runs down the middle here of your back, okay, that kind of holds you together. That's what it is. In the meantime, tips. Education really doesn't like change. 10 to 15% of individuals won't like anything to do with change, plain and simple. When I say individuals, I'm not just, I'm not talking teachers, I'm talking anybody in education. There's 10 to 15% of them, forget it, okay? These are people, as I like to describe them, they wake up in the morning and they say, oh God, not another morning, I was just getting used to yesterday. <laughs> so, don't try to convince them. Move on, you, because you've got, a whole new, you've got a whole body of people who want to work with you, who want to move forward. You must focus on mid-adapters to ensure success. This always irks the early adapters, but I'm sorry. The early adapters, you're not convincing. You're not convincing, why? Because of your very nature. <coughs> the fact that you always will try to change and do different things in different ways. That's super, it's fantastic. But to your mid-adapter colleagues sitting beside you, they kind of go, uh, another thing he's doing. Okay, or she's doing. And then they just keep doing what they're doing. You've got to convince the mid-adapters. The people at the N uh, NEC, NECC, or now what's called the COSIN, or the, uh, the uh, computer conferences, I've told them, stop, it's the same people going all the time, 15,000 people who have been seeing each other for 10 years, <laughs> talking about how great technology is in education. They, they know that. It's all the others who are still back in the schools who are not there. Those are the ones you need to bring. They're the ones that need to do it because they will be able to maintain that, and they are much better at convincing. And the late adapters, be patient. The technology, the laptops, and the infrastructure has to be reliable. If it's not reliable, forget it, they will not use it. And I said this to colleagues of mine in South America and in Central America as well. I said, if you're going to deploy with the one laptop, please make sure that your network <coughs> is solid, because the teachers are right to say, I'm not going to use it if it doesn't work. And guess what? If the network is not, it's not solid, they won't use it. They'll use it when you come in to visit, okay? And the minute you leave, they put it away again. All right? Create a sense of openness to the internet. Too many filters also serves as a major deterrent. Cell phones, okay, basically counteract all filters. And here's my, here's my filter story. 1991, I was principal in a high school in Montreal. Okay, we had a big computer center. I was the new principal, plumped into this new school. I meet the parents, and they're talking to me about and I'm answering questions about this and that. And finally, someone puts his hand up and says, Mr. Canuel, you have a big computer center. And we hear that we are, we've heard about something called the internet. 91. 
the internet, and apparently it's just full of porn. <laughs> I said, well, you know what? I'll make sure that we put in a filter. So I call my colleagues from the center, and I bring them down to, the, to my office, and I said, Do you, is there a filter that exists? And they said, yeah, Ron, you know what? We'll check it out. We'll get back to you. A few days later, they come back to me, and they said, we found this filter, and it identifies all the naughty words, all those nasty, naughty words, and the minute it comes up, it blocks, so they can't get access. I go, whoa. Oh, is that ever cool? And I said, it works? And I said, yeah, yeah, it works. And I said, it's not cheap. I said, well, it's okay. We've got to do it. We've got to protect the kids. So then we put it in. I send out a notice to all the parents. Great news. Your kids are safe. There's, there's no problem. They won't get onto porn sites. They won't do anything like this. Everything's okay. Three weeks later, the coordinator comes down. He says, I got good news and bad news. I said, oh, no. Well, what's the bad news? He says, the bad news is, he says, they figured out how to get around the filter. I said, well, what's the good news? He says, well, they we speak Spanish, Greek, Russian. <laughs> a filter to a child is a challenge. It's plain and simple. If students are able to hack into the Pentagon, I can assure you they can get around your filter. Okay, like this. And I've had school principals tell me cell phones. Teachers use cell phones regularly for their students to tell them instead of using their laptops in the schools, take out your cell phones and go around it because they can't block the cell phone. And as I mentioned to you, adults, filters give adults a very false sense of security. It's really more for the adults, just to make them feel that they got something. The curriculum must support the integration of technology and become transformational. Please, and this research is pretty convincing on this one, if you use technology just to replicate what you're doing, it's a waste of money in terms of standardized components, in terms of uh, summative assessment. If you're going to do it within a formative assessment context, you're on the right track. If somehow you're going to try to replicate what you've been doing and just simply digitize it and say, well, I'm going to digitize and I'm going to keep doing the same thing, useless, no effect, you'll see that, I can tell you, and I'll save you a lot of money. Teacher PD must be in class and focus on the integration. I call, you know, the big sessions where you have someone training the teachers in the big hall, kind of like a dog and pony show. Okay, like that, don't do that. It doesn't work. Uh, Phi Delta Kappa, by the way, in a research last year said that they did a study on professional development models in school districts in the United States and Canada, and they found that the models for the most part were miserable and didn't work. Mm -hmm. So we've got to rethink as well, how do we do? I mean, our, the way we did it, we did it in class. Oh, it was slower, it was longer, but it worked. It was much better, much, much better. So be careful, younger versus seasoned teachers. And this is a recent study that just came up, and we already knew this, but I just cited this one as well. Uh, because they're younger teachers doesn't mean that they're tech savvy, that they may be, but even if they are tech savvy, they're not pedagogically savvy. They don't have their pedagogy down yet. So many teachers, for the most part, the younger teachers, will put aside the technology and then focus on their pedagogy. Whereas the more seasoned teachers, who are more at ease with their pedagogy, take in and embrace in the technology. Kind of surprised us as well, but it was a definite trend and pattern. Pragmatic buy-in, not philosophical buy-in, very, very important. Make sure that when people say, I think this is a wonderful idea, that they really, really mean it, and not just simply go, we're with you, Jim. You know, and then kind of turn away. You have to make sure that they're with you, that they really are. It's not about the technology, it's about the people who use it. It's all about that. And, and this is what we have to remember. And the constant supervision, the monitoring, and, and to Jim, to colleagues as well, others, you've got to keep monitoring this because there will be that fallback, you know, to get back to the way we used to do. It's kind of like easier. It's just, it's just easier. It's not necessarily better. Uh, evaluation drives instruction. Now, the curriculum people always hate this when I write this, but it's the truth. Okay? Teachers are driven by how they have to evaluate. So before you begin to make this transformational notion, Develop your evaluative rubrics ahead of time. Do that first. What do you want the children to have when they come out of the classroom? What are those objectives? And then build your curriculum towards that. Too often I've seen curriculum getting built and practice built first, and then the assessment comes after. No, it won't work well. Otherwise, as I mentioned to you, it gets back into the old typical uh, you know, sit and get, as we heard this morning. And finally, what I think the most important one is technology is creating a new environment in the classroom where the voice of the student is beginning to predominate. And we have to allow that voice to expand and be integrated into the design of the lesson plans. And the more the voice of students is listened to, the better the learning and the teaching environments. It is now time that we have to embrace this voice. 
This is a new voice. This is what technology, if there's anything that technology has been doing, and we can talk about all sorts of other things, without a doubt in my mind, it is now that the voice of students, and you go into a classroom that's technology rich and really transformational, the students are non-stop talking to the teacher about how to improve things, how to get this better, what we can do here, what we can do there. And that's what I was saying to you about empowerment. So let me just show you quickly here, because I'm running out of, to assume out of time, but the fundamentals of what I call the convinced matrix. So, courage. How much do you adhere to your moral purpose of making a difference for others? Jim, you mentioned that this morning, the moral imperative. I do not believe that there's any one person in here that when you applied for your position, you wrote that you wanted to make sure that you could do standardized tests very well and come up with the type of assignments that would be most boring, okay? No, not one of you wrote that. Each and every one of you wrote, I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference for children. And Michael Fullen talked about that in his book as well. Your moral imperative. The reason you got into this job in the first place was not to make a system run smoothly. You didn't write that. You wrote that you wanted to make a difference for children. Where does happiness belong in your educational plans? Where is that? And sustainable happiness, this is embedded in your curriculum and your assessment rubrics. It had better be, because this is what we need to develop. This is what we need to work towards. So in the matrix, there are, there are two axes, the beliefs and, their beliefs, and what are they? Well, they're a state or habit of mind in which trust or confidence is placed in some person or thing. Values are the basis for our behavior and motivation. Values are abstract, hierarchical, dynamic concepts that essentially describe what we desire or seek to achieve. And evidence, a thing or things helpful in forming a conclusion or judgment. And then happiness is a state of well-being and contentment. So when we look at the matrix and... Along the vertical axis, we have what I call courage, beliefs, values, positive. Then we have also have the courage, beliefs, and the negative. Evidence, lack of evidence, high evidence. And successful change happens here. Leadership is shared. When you've got high courage, beliefs, values, high evidence, this is where it's happening. And the leadership is shared. It's distributed. And we can see that. And you have it. Here, where the courage is high, beliefs, and values, difficult change, hit or miss, leadership is demonstrated. The evidence is low. 2003, when we did this, we were there. And I'll never forget someone saying to me, boy, you took a big risk. To this day, ladies and gentlemen, I have no idea what that person was talking about. I still cannot, a big risk. What do you mean by a big, what's the risk? What was the risk? I, I still don't see it. The world of pilot projects, leadership is an issue. Low courage, beliefs and values, lots of evidence. We're going to pilot this one. Okay? I cannot tell you how many pilots there have been that have been so fantastic, and I'm not kidding you, fantastic pilot projects done that have died because they just remained isolated, they never became systemic, they became so dependent on the people. Peter Senge, in his essay on change in education, wrote about this extensively, saying about how we need to be able to nurture change within all schools, and that if you do say we're going to pilot it here, you need to make that systemic commitment in the following sentence. Without it, I can assure you, death by delay. Then you have no change, and leadership is the issue. And so then you have these elements here. So innovation and transformation, as I mentioned to you, tends to be in that quadrant. The key factor is courage. Now, it's not empiricism or logic that will assure happiness. And it's not having an educational system that strives to create productive global citizens that will generate happiness. The Renaissance remains the only period of time where spiritualism and knowledge were blended together in instruction. And if you look at this, and if you do an analysis, you will find that it was only in the Renaissance that we do see a very clear continuum right across the curriculum of all subject matter, including spiritualism, faith, the arts, sciences, music, and, and on and on. And it was right in that strand. Every other time within our history, we have seen certain parts of the curriculum being abstracted and pulled out. And you can make your own conclusions as to where we are in the 21st century with the curriculum that we now have. But it's not to be impressed, but rather leave convinced. And that's what I'm hoping I'm going to try to do. So you, I'm going to show you a slide presentation here. And no, it's ready. Okay. <laughs> you owe nothing to me, but more to these people about whom you are to see. And in 2001, when I had my bypass surgery and this one-to-one -one 
initiative that we did, a colleague of mine, my director of pedagogy, Dennis McCullough, was by my side. He visited me in the hospital the day before my operation, and he was there. And he was also there when he brought forth, he was the one who said, what about a one-to-one, -one, Ron, for you know, a school and a pilot? And I said, Dennis, don't ever say pilot to me, not now after my surgery. We're going to do everything, we'll do it systemically. And he said, you're nuts. But Dennis was with me, and then Dennis also tragically passed away before he could see this come to light. And he passed away within six weeks. And he never knew what hit him, but it was a cancer. A very, very rare cancer. And all I can say to you is that he dedicated his life to it, and he died for it in a way. And in this case here, what I want to tell you is that I read a poem at his funeral. It's called The Dash by Linda Ellis. Now more than ever, these children of the world really deserve all our support, starting and ending with happiness. Thank you very much. So we have five minutes for questions. Uh, fire away. Any questions? That was very impressive, but I'm still not convinced. <laughs> 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 you knew that was coming. Oh, for sure. Oh, yes, for sure. Yes. What kinds of things did you do with the computers that raised the engagement? Well, here's where we were fortunate because in the province of Quebec, we uh, they had initiated a constructivist curriculum. So all of a sudden, it was a shift towards the whole notion of building content, creating content, 
rather than the whole shift towards you know the, 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 the replication of knowledge and everything like this. So what it, what, it, what it brought about was what we call cross-curricular competencies, the development that that the students were developing competencies not only in math, but then were able to be transported into language, then transported into the arts. So it was it was this whole notion. It was that's why the serendipity was there as well. So it really allowed for the students to create um, well again very much of their own content uh, and in terms of the development. So we tried to move extensively towards uh, formative assessments. Uh, we also did uh, looping. We also began looping. Uh, within the school so that you know the students stayed with teachers longer periods of time uh, We did a number of things that just came around by by suggestions and uh, and Incorporating what the students were saying. I'll never forget one of the focus groups that we had with the students We did a number of them at the beginning of the initiative and we asked the students What kind of training do you think it would be good to train the students with the use of the technologies? And and I'll never forget this grade six student said oh, yeah, he says I, I think that's a good idea. Mr. Canyon. I said okay. I said so like well, how much time? And he went, uh, 20 minutes? <laughs> like, okay, fine, 20 minutes, you'll get it. You know, like this, yeah. So they, they have a very, very different notion in terms of this. But a cautionary note, though, too. Because students are at ease with technology, does not suggest that they know how to use it properly. Okay? And the one thing that I still find baffling is students really don't know how to search very well. And I'm talking K to 12 students. They really are not good search people. Like, so when you ask them to do a search, and, Ooh, it gets pretty muddy, you know. But they, they, they do it. And it was also good because there were some teachers who were kind of wanting to stick to the traditional ways of doing things, but they wanted to integrate the technology. So I was in a class once with the Minister of Education from Quebec, who was with me. And the teacher said, okay, children, now I asked you to find the date of when Jacques Cartier was born. So could you please tell me that? So right away, the student put the hand up and said, oh, I forget, let's say 1470. And then the teacher said, that's right. And another said, oh, no, it's 1471. And another one, oh, it's 1468. And what do you mean? Like this, and we'll look at on this site here, and look at on this site, and this site. So right away, the teacher had to adjust, you know, like this. And so we finally came to the conclusion no one really knew. You know, like this. But we just felt it was not that important. And that's what I'm saying. These things just percolated up. In terms of the, the government, the government provides us funding to pay for the teacher salaries. Every other funding that we had was through local taxation. So that when we did what we did, we had to secure the monies to do this. But what was funny and interesting, in by law, in the province of Quebec, like anywhere else, it's illegal for a school board to have a deficit. So what we did was we said, well, we're going to write to the deputy minister whom we knew was very much in favor of this whole shift towards technology and constructive curriculum and such. So we wrote him a letter and we said, listen, this is how we plan on doing it. We're going to secure the bank loans. We're going to have the foundation. We'll try our best to do it. He wrote us back and said, go ahead and do it. So we did it. But then the finance people two years later from the government said, who gave you the permission to do that? We said, the deputy minister did. They went, he did? <laughs> so we said, hey, you know, better to ask for forgiveness than permission. So we moved forward. And, and by the way, Dr. Kersancy, Thierry Kersancy, who is the chair of research for technology and education in Canada, has been conducting now into the fourth year study of the school board. He's, uh, other research is coming out soon. But in 2010, he did put out a research at the Eastern Township School Board, which I invite you to go and see their website, which is not a great website, by the way. I told him that. I said, you haven't even changed and updated, but they are going to do that. However, I'll never forget what Dr. Kassansi said to me when he called me up about the results. He said, Ron, this is a 2010. He said, you know, 98% of the teachers in the district are in support of the use and integration of technology in their classrooms. I'm wow, 98% support of technology. He said, no, 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 you, you're missing the bigger point. I said, what's that? He said, I've never seen teachers, 98% of teachers agree on anything. <laughs> you know, he said, I, I've never seen a research where 98% of teachers believe that strongly about something. He said, in this case, it happened to be technology. He says, so all the better. But in, in the case, he said like this, so you do have that. Yeah. Uh, you said the, s the students were quick to adapt with 20 minutes of training. I was wondering uh, what was the time estimate on uh, teacher professional development, and uh, secondly, I'm wondering if uh, there's a movement towards tablet devices 
in those schools and wireless connectivity and things like that? Absolutely. Great question. In the contract we signed with Apple, one of the reasons why we chose Apple at that time was very simple. We just wanted a simple machine to be able to use because we knew that if the teachers, if we, listen, there were 2003, there were still teachers who wouldn't use an ATM. Okay, let alone come with a laptop. And we didn't even have high speed wireless. As a matter of fact, there wasn't even cell phone service in a number of our schools. It didn't even exist. So when we did this in terms of professional development with Apple, we integrated into the contract 215 days over a three year period of time. So we, we 215 days of professional development so that we were able to extract the teachers, bring them into other classrooms, bring them, like, as I was saying, the in classroom. So to the point where the teachers union complained that there was too much PD going on. They were, they, there's too much wrong. And we said, okay, but we'll slow it down a bit. So we did it that way. The school district since then uh, has put it this way. There are tablets, there's chart, uh, I was gonna say this show, your friend show, uh, carts uh, in kindergarten. It's, it's right across, and I remember, you know, when I would be still at the school district and then bringing in delegations. I remember a delegation from Jordan came into the, the, one of some of the schools and we were touring, and I was touring. And after, the teachers came up and said, Ron, how come these people are visiting us? And I said, because what you guys are doing, no one else is doing. And they would go, really? And, and to this day, they still believe that everyone else is doing this. That this, you know, that this is a norm. And when they meet other colleagues and they're told, uh, no, and I know in my job position now where I go across Canada, I've gone into some districts, they just installed wireless six months ago in a school. So I'm going, yeah. One last question. So I'm wondering how, um, how you decided to go with computers as opposed to other forms of technology, um, like smart boards or something like that. How is the priority? Just it was simple. Uh, smart boards didn't exist then, so that, that was easy. Uh, the laptops were around, so they were still kind of like big and clunky. Okay, and um, uh, so it, there were no tablets, you know, like this. Uh, so in this day and age, how would that? How would you prioritize those well, things? Well, the teacher might prefer a smart board as opposed to. Okay. Great question. What the the, uh, the school board continues to survey the teachers closely and accurately. The teachers are responding back that for production purposes the laptop still rules. The iPad is close, but the laptop is still ruling on that component. For tablets, it's not as good of a production, more good for communication, more good for transmission of information, everything like this. So, uh, so the school district is still looking at laptops, but they are moving as well towards the iPad. And they're, they're, they're beta testing everything. I mean, they've got, I think, four different platforms now. You know, in there, I know there's, there's Apple, there's, uh, there's uh, uh, not HP, there's uh, Dell, there's all sorts. So they're trying everything. Thank you very much. Thank you.